and welcome to Theory Wave. Today, I want to talk about Die Hard Drive and virtual reality. But not like VR chat virtual reality. I want to show how Die Hard can be read as an allegory for Jody Dean's concept of drive. Specifically, how it captures us at the convergence of communication technologies and late capitalism. My hope is to elicit some kind of postmodern reading of this 30 year old ass movie to essentially explain why we get FOMO from scrolling through Instagram. Why Die Hard? What can this movie possibly say about the internet in 2019? Well, on the surface, it's about John McClane rescuing his wife from Death Eaters? Holly, John's estranged wife, is some bigwig at the Nakatomi Corp, and she leapt his ass to pursue her career on some neoliberal feminist type shit. But, Professor Snape's ass wants to steal all this dough during the Christmas party, and he takes all these corporate slumlords hostage. So, if John wants to reunite with his family, he has to defeat Bowser and rescue the princess. Wait a minute. Anyways, under all this boring plot, I believe that Die Hard is really about the transition into the postmodern, as described by Jean Baudrillard. The postmodern is a blurring of the lines between human beings and machines, a blurring of the line between reality and image. Reality is simply that which can be simulated, Xeroxed, copied. See, John is experiencing the acceleration of the world as it shifts from the modern to the postmodern, where his material reality and identity are dissolving. However, in his pursuit to recapture this lost modernity, he only simulates resolving the anxieties and lost objects of his life by entering drive in a virtual space which simulates participation without actually resolving the material conditions which create his loss. Desire is constructed by the ideology of the dominant culture, which communicates to us its values and anxieties in images. In postmodernity, these values and anxieties have been copied ad infinitum so as to be lost to the images themselves. It is in part due to the technological ease at which these images can be reproduced that the shift in our culture can be attributed, but it is also due to the neoliberal free market where the overproduction of images accelerate our drive to participate in their market. John's desires are that which maintain the dominant white American capitalistic democratic and patriarchal culture. Take for example the lost object of John's desire, Holly. While his external motivation in the film is to save her from the terrorists, his actions are also motivated unconsciously by the images that accelerate his logic of desire. Logic of desire is described in American film as such. Irrespective of what a protagonist thinks his goal, problem, or ambition is at the practical everyday level, he is also engaged at the symbolic or cultural level, usually in a crisis of identity. In other words, John is not merely motivated by his personal desire for family. He desires this precisely because cultural anxieties have elicited a disequilibrium in his identity. Capitalism has created the missing object in his life. His identity as a white working class male and the patriarch of his family are displaced by symbols, that is, his wife's career, the corporation she works in, the terrorists, and the technology. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. Anything. Capitalism caused the generation of these symbols, yet imbues them as the cause of his distress and not the system which is driven by profit so much as to actually disregard the safety of humanity in favor of an elite few. The end of modernity is signified by the indistinction between reality and virtual reality, and we enter Die Hard's virtual world as John enters LA. He traverses loosely and lonely through the airport, where he can practically hear the mall soft in the background. He sees a couple ecstatically reunite. He is distant and dismissive of them, but really they are an image meant to contrast and exploit his disconnect from Holly. Therefore, John, like us, experiences ideological anxieties at the everyday level in the images he consumes. This phenomenon is accelerated in our lives by our addictions to social media, where the consumption of images and communication are exploited for data to sell. 
John's first encounter in the Nakatomi Plaza is another example of this exploitation of communication. Like, communication is immediately displaced to the computer that simulates it. John dips his finger into the pool of knowledge of what is real and what is final. In this virtual phone book, he can't find Holly by McLean, but must confront his anxiety and search for her by her maiden name instead. This expands the disconnect between them and displays how communicative technologies elicit real emotions that accelerate his logic of desire. John's logic of desire is what stands in for what we experience as drive. Both desire and drive emerge from Lacanian psychoanalysis. However, while the former applies well to the structure of narrative, Drive explains how our own logic is motivated not by a lost object like in McLean's case, but by loss itself as the object. Jody Dean explains in Blog Theory that we are captured, as it were, in a loop or repetition where we gain satisfaction merely by chasing the loss. The satisfaction is gained by the feedback loop of Drive itself. It is in this heralding in of images that we have lost what they actually mean. Yet we still chase the desire, the loss, in hopes that capturing the image will alleviate the contradictions of our lives. The only way to alleviate the anxieties that neoliberal capitalism incites is to buy the solution in the free market or drown it out in other media. Therefore, we could say that it is the function of watching Die Hard itself that accelerates this drive in our lives by capturing us in a simulation of reaching our desire where they are not actually resolved in real life, only in a virtual story, where we are engaged at a level that is distant, yet still interactive enough to satisfy our democratic free will. Communicative technology fulfills our desire to be recognized as a subject, whether by the machine's feedback from another person, or from the feedback of the machine itself. The joke is that it doesn't really matter anyways. We most often engage with these images in a non-space or virtual space where images have become interactive. Morris's Virtualities describes non-space as an elsewhere that inhabits the everyday. It is displaced from society, yet provides a microcosmic reflection of it. Places like the mall, the freeway, or the airport are links to a virtual reality where the communication of values takes place. However, in an exploitative exchange, with the advent of smartphones, the non-space expands and becomes ever-present. Right in our pocket is the ability to escape reality, engage with images, and simulate participation in a utopian consumer society. In Die Hard, the Nakatomi Plaza is representative of a virtual non-space dystopia, where the control of neoliberal capital is displaced by terrorists who hack into the building's network shut it off from the outside world, and displace it from the foundation of modernity. That is, materially, the control of capital, existentially, the belief that there ever was a subjective reality at all. This reality is replaced by a virtual reality which digitizes individuals and turns them into consumers, data, and virtual participators. John experiences this digitization too. He is desubjectified, that is, the technology fails to recognize him as a subject, which becomes life-threatening to him. If nobody likes my post, does anybody even care that I'm alive? It is only by accepting the virtual that he can save himself. This acceptance is represented by the entering into the vents of the building, like he has data being shot along a fiber optic cable. After this, he successfully connects to the network. He gains a walkie-talkie, a link to the non-space of communication. And now that he is fully digitized and downloaded into the machine, he will reclaim his identity by dominating the space around him. Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequined shirts. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. He believes that by destroying the symbols of post-modernity, he will re-establish the modern order of white American patriarchy, slash control. 
like the scene where he just blows up the whole goddamn place with the Macintosh Plus button? Fuck it. He is destroying the symbol of his anxiety, technology, which stands in for his anxiety about the way it communicates to him and his disconnect from white collar slash postmodern world. However, John is a fool if he believes that his mastery of this space is any indication of agency at all, because it is not his real power that is reasserted, it is an imaginary democratic free will he feels while chasing the lost object in the circuit of drive. In fact, his success can only happen in a virtual space where reality is suspended. He is able to compress space and time and simulate resolutions to his personal problems, like he is playing a video game. Really, it is this personalization or privatization of problems that prevents us from making the structural changes necessary to abolish the capitalist system which manufactures the anxiety of our lives. Drive tricks working class people like John into believing they actually have a say in our democracy when they participate in a virtual network market. Participation in the market of communication displaces the fact that our political democracy is in fact controlled by corporations and driven by neoliberal interests. Contemporary communications media capture their user in intensive networks of enjoyment, production, and surveillance. My term for this formation is communicative capitalism. Just as industrial capitalism relied on the exploitation of labor, so does communicative capitalism rely on the exploitation of communication. What we see in Die Hard as the resolution is merely a simulation of resolution under communicative capitalism. John is able to reestablish his nuclear family by exchanging his autonomy for the autopilot of drive. He gains personal satisfaction along the ride and reestablishes the status quo by embodying its desires, not by changing the dominant culture which create his anxiety. I find John's first encounter with Hans to be analogous to our experiences online. For example, we constantly have to decipher authenticity. Hans puts on a facade, hides behind the anonymity of the internet, to try and trick John. And even though he read his Internet Fishing for Dummies guide, Hans escapes with his buddies and starts bussing down with the llama. They trap John in the computer room, or rather attempt to trap him in the postmodern by breaking the barriers of modernity, that is, the glass. However, John's desire to reestablish these barriers are enough to make him sacrifice his own body with the labor necessary to maintain capitalism. Slavoj might call this pure ideology. John saves Holly by mimicking that authenticity himself, only to pull out the Draco at the end and shoot Hans through the window. And now, Hans is hanging on to that goddamn Rolly for dear life. But oh wait, what's this? In an extremely cheese move, John removes the watch from her wrist and he falls to his death? John sacrifices the image of Molly's well to reestablish his family. He successfully destroys the image his wife has become while also destroying the terrorists and the Nakatomi Corporation. His battle seems to be won. However, his exchange was an exploitation. John risked his life and limb for what? For it is the institutions who gained capital and control from his labor. The news cashed in on the frenzy, despite Molly's <laughs> Cops cashed in on the terrorists, despite the fact that they're not actually terrorists. And the company loses nothing because it's global. They just get a badass insurance check. That's what Drive does, though. It asserts these lost objects as something which can be bought in the virtual space. And once we do own it, we feel like we've made a choice of our democratic free will. It feels like we have power and agency when we mimic the images of power that we see online. But the structural forces which have alienated us from being able to realize our true desires have not changed. Neoliberalism exploits the globally connected network of communication. 
The political implications of being captured in Drive is that by continuously looping around loss and simulating participatory democracy through the free market, we are increasing capital and exploitation without a second thought. As Dean says, the paradox of technological fetish is that the technology acting in our stead actually enables us to remain politically passive. We don't have to assume political responsibility because the technology is doing it for us. Like, a retweet and a vote hold about the same weight, apparently. Or like, where people don't even have to engage IRL because they're engaging online and that's good enough. Like me creating this video. Yes. Yes.